Nice to see the young people getting in there and serving the Lord, using their talents. Amen. Well, good evening. We talked uh, a number of weeks ago now before, before we went through all the COVID stuff about doing a short series on what? Parenting. Yes. And this is a, uh, it's a very difficult thing I find to do. Um, a little series on parenting one I really enjoy teaching you know all of the other doctrinal things and so for me this is a bit of a departure to try to focus on just some practical tools and aspects that God's word gives us some really sound advice uh, about parenting uh, secondly it's difficult because parenting is such a it's just a really big topic I mean it's not like there's a checklist of three things, and if you do this, it's great. Uh, parenting isn't like that at all. I mean, it is just, it's just not a recipe. It's not mechanical. Um, it is, uh, you're dealing with people, so it's messy. Uh, anytime you're dealing with people, it's just, it's just going to be messy, right? I mean, there's emotion involved. There's uh, all kinds of things that go into this. Uh, but nonetheless, I do think it's valuable and it's important for us as a congregation to at least spend some time. We've got a lot of young people. We've got a lot of young families. We've got other uh, young couples who are uh, having children. And so we've got a lot of small children. And even Jim Farrow in his, uh, you know, older years is still got a young one here. So... A lot of young people in the congregation, and so I do think parenting is just more important. I mean, it's always been important, but it seems like it's more important now than ever uh, to talk about really sound parenting principles. And the difficult thing about this topic, I find, too, is that it's so immense in that parenting changes um, over the course of your child's life and your life. It will change uh, dramatically, so it's really difficult to capture uh, I think all of the elements that are involved. So this is not intended to be uh, comprehensive. This is not intended to be all encompassing as far as, uh, you know, everything you'll need to be a parent. But what I do find is that, um, that God's word speaks to us as parents in some really particular ways. And I've lived long enough to see that God's way works and the world's way doesn't work. And so I've lived enough life to see uh, problems in families uh, where compromises were made on what God's word says. And we think it's not going to crop up and, and matter. We think it's going to go uh, unnoticed and it won't, it's not really meaningful. I mean, 
the sermon this morning, right? Don't gather sticks on the Sabbath day. I mean, how important could that be? That's not going to matter. Uh, it's just, I'm just going to go pick up some sticks. You can almost hear the guy's wife telling him, you shouldn't go. You ought not go. No. And, yeah, and you can almost hear the guy saying, I'm just going to get a few sticks. I mean, what's the worst that could happen, right? Famous last words. Um, so we think sometimes that God's word, yeah, he says, you know, that we ought to do it this way. But I mean, I don't think it's really going to matter. Uh, it's such a small thing. It's such a small detail. And yet, you know, what I continue to find makes the big difference in parenting is the little things. Uh, when it comes to parenting, it is a long haul game. Uh, it is not, it's not like you did it well for a week and so it's just fine. Parenting is a long haul deal. Uh, and it's, it's the cumulative effect and power of a thousand little things that are done uh, the way God tells us to do them and just trusting him with it. Uh, and ultimately, trusting him with it means trying to follow his counsel. If you don't trust him, you won't follow his counsel. Uh, if you don't trust him, you're not going to listen to what, what the word of God has to say about any of these things anyway. So thirdly, I find um, that parenting is a difficult topic to teach on because probably none of you are very interested in what I have to say about parenting, right? I mean, it's not like people are beating my door down for my advice on parenting. Uh, but anyways, I'm the pastor, and I think that Paul spent some time on these things, and so I think, well, I'm just going to give it a shot, and since I'm the pastor, um, being behind the pulpit gives me a chance to at least share some things with you from Scripture, and it affords you the opportunity to decide what to do with those things. Uh, so some of these things will be very practical. Uh, a lot of what we're going to talk about is principles. And so that's what I want to talk about. I, I told you that I'd kind of divided up this study into basically taking the word parent uh, and turning it into an acrostic and using each letter to kind of develop an idea around parenting that I think is really foundational to the entire idea of parenting. It's interesting in God's word that he doesn't, um, he doesn't give us, you know, there's not like a place you can go where it's like, oh, this is the chapter on parenting or, you know, this is the go-to place. It's really uh, the cumulative body of knowledge of what God's word speaks to. And ultimately, I, I would be remiss if I didn't say uh, it's a work of his spirit. If we're not co-laboring with Christ in this thing, uh, and if we think we're going to do it all, we're going to mess it all up. Um, if we think he's going to do it all so we don't have to do anything, uh, we're going to mess it all up. This is a co-labor. As we said, the Bible says, warn them that are unruly. That was kind of our foundational verse for this topic of parenting. Because the whole idea of being unruly is not showing up for work. That God has, in fact, given us an assignment. He's given us work. And just as Christ said... Uh, and the, at the judgment, he's going to say, you've been faithful over a few things. I'm going to make you ruler over 10 cities. Uh, so, you know, we have these jobs that he's given us to do. Parenting is a big one. And so the question is, when it comes to parenting, we think about this. How do we really show up for work? Because there is a job to do. It's a job that is given to us by God himself. And we're called and expected as parents to show up for work, to do the job that's necessary to be done. And so this is an act of service uh, to God and to Christ. That's what we left off with last time. Uh, and of course, I've got the little service bell there, right? You see what I did there? Because the question is, are you going to answer the bell? Are you going to answer the bell? There's more to having kids than taking cute pictures and putting them on Facebook. Right? There's, there's a lot more involved to this, and there's a lot on the line. And the reason I want to teach through some of this is uh, I, I love your children. I know some of you think I hate your children uh, because I may be prone to correct them uh, or to try to give them some instruction and guidance along the way about what the expectations are uh, when we're gathered here. Now, I'll just let you know, in your own homes, um, that's your deal, right? You're the parents. You're responsible for how you run your homes. I'm responsible for teaching the word of God. You're responsible for how you apply the word of God in your life. Uh, and it's the same in your home. However, when we're gathered together and in the assembly, 
Uh, as the pastor, I have oversight and responsibility to Christ. So I do feel a certain amount of responsibility uh, for the assembly when we're all gathered together to see to it that things kind of happen in an orderly fashion. From time to time, that may mean speaking with one of your children. Uh, I don't feel like that's out of turn uh, and in the assembly because from time to time, I might even speak to you about something. Who knows? It's, uh, we, we got to kind of keep this thing going in the direction that Christ would have it to go. So I hope that you'll receive this in the spirit that it's given and that it'll be useful to you. Um, if, if you already have it all figured out and it's all going great, um, then just, you know, enjoy. Just enjoy. Just sit back. Enjoy the slideshow. Um, you know, do whatever. But if, if you're like me and you're, you're always looking uh, to learn and to grow, I, th I think there's a lot to be learned um, about the time any parent thinks they've got it all figured out, something happens like the next day to really shake your world and make you realize, okay, I don't maybe have uh, all this as together as I thought. So I want to talk about the P. What is, as if God were to give you this job of parenting, for a lot of you he has, and we say this is an act of service, then what are some services that you are expected to provide to your children because you are a service provider okay you are you are uh, an individual through whom Christ is working to meet a need of someone else so as he's creating men and women and bringing them into this world through the natural birth he gives these young people to parents and those parents are tasked as his servants okay the servants of Christ to take these young people and to parent them. And so if we're going to provide these services, I think first and foremost what I'd like to spend a few minutes tonight talking about as you turn to Deuteronomy chapter number 4, I'd like to talk about that we are expected to provide our children a principled foundation. Okay, we're going to talk a little bit about what that means. And the reason I say principled is not insignificant. Your children will face different challenges than you faced. Your children will have different problems than you had. Your children are going to live and grow up in a world that is different than the one you knew. Your children are going to be confronted with worldviews and ideas that you never had to contend with. Because the world is always changing. And so it's important that we don't rear our children with just the idea of behavior, but how do we really lay the groundwork that gives them principled foundation? So the idea is to focus on principles more than rule keeping. Now, rule keeping has a place and a part to play in the rearing of a child. Anybody who knows uh, me and anything I have to say about parenting knows that. But the goal is not to impart behavioral rule keeping to a child. The goal is to give them principles, a real foundation that they can stand on. A principle is a fundamental truth that serves as the foundation for a system of belief or behavior or for a chain of reasoning. Okay, that's the definition of principle. So that's exactly what we're talking about. In Deuteronomy chapter number 4, and we could look at a lot of different places uh, in Scripture and see this, but I want to look particularly at this passage of Scripture and look at a couple of things here. Deuteronomy chapter number 4, uh, a charge being given to God's people here, and we're going to begin our reading. <gasps> Bless you. We'll begin our reading in verse number uh, one, and we're going to go ahead and read through and then just grab a couple of thoughts from verses number uh, nine and ten. Now, therefore, hearken, O Israel, unto the statutes and unto the judgments which I teach you for to do them, that ye may live and go in and possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers giveth you. You shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. Your eyes have even seen what the Lord did because of Baal Peor, for all the men that followed Baal Peor, 
the Lord thy God hath destroyed them from among you. But ye that did cleave unto the Lord your God are alive every one of you this day. Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me, that ye should do so in the land whither ye go to possess it. Keep therefore and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations, which shall hear of these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what nation is there so great, who God hath so nigh unto them, as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for? And what nation is there so great that hath statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law which I set before you this day? Only take heed to thyself and keep thy soul diligently. Lest thou forget the things which thine eyes have seen, and lest they depart from thy heart all the days of thy life. But teach them thy sons and thy sons' sons, especially the day that thou stoodest before the Lord thy God in Horeb, when the Lord said unto me, Gather me the people together, and I will make them hear my words, that they may learn to fear me all the days that they shall live upon the earth, and that they may what? Teach their children. Over and over again in this passage, we have a couple of ideas. One is that God had taught his people. Two, that because God had taught his people, they were to hearken diligently to do everything. And so you see this idea back and forth several times in this passage. Hearken and do. I taught you, so do. Be diligent to do. Right? So God is interested in his people doing his commandment and then he comes through the passage and ends up commanding them to teach their sons and their sons sons and he says that this is actually working both ways that by teaching them to the next generation it keeps them from departing from your own heart that by passing them on and commanding and teaching what it does is it builds up and affirms these truths and these statutes and these commandments in your own life. Now, if any of you have ever been responsible for teaching anything, you know that that's one of the best ways to learn anything. When you're the one that becomes responsible for teaching, uh, it goes a long way to helping your own learning. But what we see in this passage is verse number 10. It says that they may teach their children is that God expects the transfer of knowledge and information to take place from generation to generation. What's one of the two things that we said children are not born into the world with? They are not born into the world with information. Children do not come into this world with information. They, and as far as information goes, they're really a blank slate. And so... When a child comes into the world, that child is immediately gathering information. And all day, every day, that child is gathering information. That child wants to know about this world, wants to know about parents, wants to know about relationship, wants to know about having needs met, wants to know and understand about interaction and play and fun and learning and all of the things that take place in life. And a child from the ages of one to five, right in that area, uh, that whole time of life, they are just eating it up. And while most parents are just passively engaged in the process, that child is committing everything to memory. I mean, they are soaking up every interaction. They're learning about all these dynamics that we've come to take for granted. And so we just kind of passively in, are involved. But this child is learning from that everything about how they will view this life. So I said about this principled foundation, this is my statement to you for this first point, that a child's view of life Okay, because who's responsible for helping them develop that view? Their parents are. 
a child's view of life is not developed based on what their parents said. That is not how your child will develop their view of life. A child will develop their view of life in response to what they experience with their parents. That is how your child will develop their view of life. It is not, they will not necessarily mirror their parents' values, their parents' beliefs, and they will not necessarily even appreciate and mirror the experiences they have. What they will do is that they will develop their view of life and the world and themselves in response to what they experience with their parents. So this is, this is not uh, scripture. This is just where your pastor's at. This is just from me. This is what I've seen. This is what I've learned. This is what I've uh, understood from 18 years of parenting uh, and from uh, 41 years almost now of just living life and observing. And you know, from a young age, uh, I wanted to observe. I was never uh, that good at anything necessarily on my own. I didn't have natural ability and talent, uh, but I wanted to work hard at whatever I did. Uh, and parenting was always really important to me even before I had children. I knew what I wanted my family to look like. I knew what I wanted my children to be. I knew what, what was in my mind, a vision for a God-fearing family that would honor and serve the Lord Jesus Christ. It was already in my heart and in my mind before I ever had children. And so that passion for uh, what I believe is a God-honoring approach to living life and raising children and having a family was already a motivation before we even had our first child. But this is an idea that's, that's stuck with me and I've continued to see it play out time and time again. That your children, and you see this from the earliest days of a child's life, that they are developing their own view of things based on how their parents interact with them and based on the experiences they have with their parents. So when we think about giving our children principles, this is at the foundation, at the core of everything you do as a parent. Your children will know because they study you whether or not you are a principled individual. Because if they can argue with you at the age of two and win, then they know your decision was not a principled one. It was a convenient one or it was a expedient one, but it was not a principled decision. When you, you have to understand that your children, are, are they're, they're always learning from every interaction. And so even at the, from the ages of one, two, and three, if your child can pitch a fit and you change your mind, then your initial decision was not rooted in anything meaningful. Your in, initial decision and judgment on the situation was not based on anything of substance. And so if they can sway your thinking with their behavior, then what have they just learned about life? There's a principle at work in everything. There's always a principle at work. For example, uh, your children need to know by the age of one, by the time they're a year old, they must know that everything they do in life is done by permission. Now you say, what do you mean by that, preacher? Do you mean that the child has to ask for permission to do everything? No, I don't mean that the child has to ask for permission to do everything. What I mean is they need to know that everything that they do is because they have been allowed to do it. And they need to be content to rest in the idea that the parent has veto power. I get, I mean, you have so many young people arguing with their parents at the age of two and three and four and winning the arguments. Even if your three-year-old can out-argue you because they're right, they're wrong. 
they must learn to respect the parent and appreciate the value that the parent brings to the conversation. The child cannot be allowed to believe that you have no principles upon which you base your thinking, right? And so this is from the earliest age and it carries through. And I'm gonna show you a little bit about how I see that that carries through all through life. But what I want you to know is that in every interaction that you're having with your child, what is the principle that you are reinforcing with that child? Oftentimes what I see in parenting with parents and young children is they continue to reinforce to the child that you're in charge. You're in charge and my job is to appease you and to let you find out what you want. And once I know what you want, my job is to provide it to you. That is such a bad parenting principle to follow. You should tell your child no just for the sake of them learning to hear no. If your child cannot be told no and accept it and move on, you need to keep telling them no until they can accept it. They need to hear no until they realize that yes is something that is given by permission. You're not entitled to yes. I'm not required to have to anything for you, right? And so the child needs to know that because it will provide for their contentment. It will provide for their joy. But that once you realize that things in life are a gift, then you're actually in a position to enjoy them. Children who are entitled to things do not enjoy them. They feel entitled to them, but they don't enjoy them. They don't appreciate them. Children who are told no and then are given permission do. So all I'm saying is that in every interaction from the youngest of ages, I mean, August is already figuring this out, right? I mean, he's not even a year old. He's already figuring this thing out about how this is going to work. And so as a parent, it's just important to realize that underlying all of your decisions, because again, parenting is the result of a thousand little decisions. And underlying every one of those is a principle. And so you have to ask, what principles are we imparting to our children? Right? Uh, and that's what the Lord is saying. What is the chief principle that God expects parents to pass on to children? There's one. It's the chief principle of life. Because like I said, your, your children's problems will be different than yours. The world will look different. It's going to operate differently. The challenges uh, that they face will be different than the ones that you face. So you can't really just script, uh, you know, here's what you need to do because that's what I did. That probably won't work because their life is going to look different than the life you've lived. But there is one chief principle that God commands us to teach our children that will provide the absolute true north that your child needs to navigate the path of life in every circumstance without fail. You know what it is? He gives it to us in this passage. He tells us in verse number 10, especially the day that thou stoodest before the Lord thy God in Horeb, when the Lord said unto me, gather me the people together and I will make them hear my words that they may learn to what? Fear me all the days. Now listen, as a parent, you are in God's stead. You are in his place, in the, in the family, in the child's life. You are in the place of God to them. And so you make a big error in principle when your child does not have any fear of you. And notice what the fear is based on. He says, I will cause them to hear my words. So many parents celebrate the idea that their children learn the meaning of words. I, I believe that learning the meaning of words is almost meaningless if it's not coupled with learning the value of words. Learning what a word means is meaningless 
if the language has no value. And we live in a world where language has no value. Things don't actually mean what we read and what we say. There's always a loophole. There's always an excuse. There's always an alternative view. There's always a different reading. There's always a varied interpretation. Nothing just means what it means. Your job as a parent is to teach your children not the meaning of words, but the value of words. And you can't do that when you water down the meaning of words by the way you use them. For example, if you tell your child, pick up the toys, and then you leave the room and don't stay to see if they pick up the toys, and actually you forget you ever even said it, and the toys never do get picked up. What have you just done? The words have no value in the child's mind. And since they have no value, the meaning is meaningless. The meaning is meaningless. So words have to have value. Whose job is it to make sure that the child knows the value of words? It's the parent. And it starts when the child is this old, probably younger. Do not, if you can help it, use sentences and paragraphs with your young children. It is unhelpful to reason with your two-year-old. You need to use short words and use them consistently. Like, no, stop, be quiet, right? Real short, real simple, direct, and easy to understand the value of what those words mean and represent. You know, you, I hear parents in long conversations with their two and three year olds about Y and X, Y and Z, they shouldn't be doing all. Those things come in time, but there is a time and a season for every purpose and everything. And when a child is between the ages of one and five is not the time to be practicing reasoning skills. They haven't developed the intellectual capacity to reason well, and yet parents allow them to reason. It's not reasonable to let your child reason. I was having a conversation with uh, a young man the other day who's about three years old, and it's dark outside, and he looks up and he says, uh, what's that up in the sky? Because he obviously didn't know. And I said, that's an airplane. And he said, that's not an airplane. You didn't know what it was. So how can you tell me that you know what it's not? I said, yes, it is an airplane, and don't argue with adults. He says, well, I can't hear it. I said, well, see those lights? That's what airplanes look like in the night. You know what his answer is? Airplanes don't have lights on them. <laughs> and I said, actually, every airplane has lights on it as required by law. They all have lights on them. So what's the problem? How does a kid make it to that age of, of three years old and still have such a high opinion of his own ideas? There's principles at work. When you're allowed as a young child to argue and to reason, it stands to reason that your point of view holds as much weight as anyone else's, and that is a false idea. You cannot allow the young child to believe that their opinion holds as much value as anyone else's, because it's not true. They need to learn how to be taught. And children do not come forth from the womb knowing how to learn. They must be taught to be learners. And your child, even in the secular things of life, will go so far in life if they learn to be a learner. But you know that bratty little know-it-all that never really goes anywhere because he's too smart to learn. He already knows everything. Children must be taught to learn and you are responsible for teaching them that they are to be learners. God put you on this earth to learn. And that starts at a very young age. August needs to know he's a learner. He's not a contributor. 
at this point. He won't be a contributor at two or three as far as the intellectual things. Now, he is a contributor in the sense that God uses him to form in Gabby and in Nathan better character, better, um, more Christ-likeness, a more servant-related attitude and heart and mind because they have someone in their life that they love immensely. And love always prom promotes those kind of things in a person's life. So it's, I'm not saying he's useless. I'm saying he's not a contributor in the sense that we don't really need his opinion to get by. Uh, that we're doing okay without him offering us a lot of opinions about life at this point. When a child is, is young, and I'm focusing mostly on the youth because we have a lot of youth, a child is learning a couple of things, and I want you to really take note of these. Really take note of this. It's immensely important, and as a parent, you need to keep these things in focus uh, really their entire life, but particularly, uh, I, I think in the early years of their life, this is immensely important, and then in their teen years. Um, probably those two patches of ground is where this really comes into play. They're learning these two things. Personal identity, okay? Personal identity. Remember, August doesn't have a personal identity. He's going to develop one. And his parents are going to be the single biggest contributor to what he chooses as a personal identity. They will be. I mean, as much as grown children hate the idea that their parents have that much influence on their identity, it's a fact. I mean, you're, you're just created that way by God. And so much of what your parents do goes into the identity that you choose to take to yourself. So your child is learning about personal identity. And then in context, what is personal identity? In context, it's community participation. So your child is learning personal identity and community participation. How does this, how does this community work? Right? How does this thing work uh, as a group? And so the, the child has a lot of questions about this. They want to know what are the beliefs of the community, particularly the family community. The reason I focus on this is because even uh, older kids, like we've got some older teens who will be starting families. We've got some older uh, teens that just started a family. And what is, how does this work is that you are learning all of your life how to participate in a community so that when you grow up, you can lead a community. Until you learn how to function as a member of a community in a healthy way, you cannot effectively lead a community. And so as a mom and as a dad, your job is to lead a small community. And you can't really do that if you've not learned how to be a healthy functioning member of a community. And so many children get to those years in life and they've not really grasped the idea that that I know how to function now as a healthy member of a community and now I know what it takes to go and to lead one on my own. And so that's an essentially important thing. But the child, they're always asking these questions. What are the beliefs? How is truth defined? How do we understand truth? How do we apply truth? And this is really at the foundation uh, of, of what the child's experience with mom and dad speaks to is what is true, how do I know it, and how do I use it in my life? Many parents, if not obviously the vast majority of parents, instill in their children a principle that you are the measure of truth. Because even in believing homes, when this conflate, conflicts with mom and dad's opinion, what wins the day? Mom and dad's opinion. If this can go ignored when it's inconvenient, the child is not ignorant of that fact. You know what the child then learns? That this can go ignored when it's inconvenient. That's the principle. That's the instruction that's been imparted. That's what the child has experienced with their parents. That when this is not convenient, when it conflicts with my interests or my desires or my priorities, whatever word you want to use, that it can be set aside and it's okay. It's okay to set this aside and, and just choose something else because there are other choices after all that can be made. People make other choices. Uh, and so the question is, when you're teaching in your home, 
where do you go to say the reason our family does it this way is because? Because at the end of the day, it means something to be a Marx. It means something to be a Pharaoh. It means something to be a Walker. It means something to be a Hickerson or a Lockhart. That means those names mean something. It carries significance that God has given you and your family this unique identity. And as a family, where do we go to get the fundamental answers of truth? When we need an answer, where do we go? When we hear something from the pulpit in the house of God that contradicts what we do as a family, what's the response of the community to the teaching of the word of God? Is there, is there humility? Is there repentance? Is there obedience? Is there seeking the glory and honor of Christ? Or do we cling to those things that are comfortable, familiar, convenient, expedient, whatever the, the case may be? In all of those cases, your children are learning. They're learning from all these thousands of experiences. And a lot of it, I don't even think that, it, that we as people are necessarily conscious of it's just the unspoken unwritten experiences that we draw from in life and so those things absolutely hold a tremendous amount of weight can you as a family say look the reason we do it this way in the Farnsworth household I know that a lot of other people do life a lot of different ways but let me explain to you as my children as my wife the reason we do it this way is because I find in the word of God this teaching. And in God's unchanging, holy, divine word that he has given to man, he has taught us by his word that has value, that these words have value in my life and being instructed in those things, we have learned from them how we then must live. And you teach that to your children. And you say, There's, it is not just arbitrary. The power not, doesn't lie in me. The power and the truth lies in God's word. But ultimately, the child will learn to discern what's the standard and measure of truth. Is it the individual or is it the revealed mind of God? And the child will learn that in the home. And if the standard of truth is the individual then uh, the clearly there's, there's a lot at stake for a child that grows up and is led to believe that the, the truth and the measure of truth is the individual themselves. Or is that individual created under God? As we know even from our secular constitution, right? That we are under authority. We're not an authority unto ourselves. So as they ask these questions, what are the beliefs of the community? What are the values of the community? In your little family community, what are the values? I mean, it reminds me of the old uh, Wheel of Fortune, people, places, or things, you know? Every family values something. Their family culture will either value people, it will value experiences, right? Vacations and doing and going, and, or it will value things materialism the interesting thing about values is you cannot value all those things if you value people then some of the other things will have to give way if you value things then you really can't value people so what is the culture in your community what are the values not the beliefs right we've, we've moved on from beliefs what do you value what are the things that have uh, value in your community in your life in your world do you value the people that God has put in it or do you value uh, in other words if you're you can demonstrate this in a lot of ways uh, what ruins your day you might be still with the group of people that you were planning on being with but the experience didn't turn out like maybe you had in your mind and so you're angry with everybody you know why because you don't value the people you wanted the experience to be a certain way because that's what you value. So when you value the experience, you'll abuse the people. Even though the whole point of having an experience 
is to have it with someone. I mean, if you go do something by yourself and there's no one to share it with or tell it about, that's not much fun, is it? But yet you find people becoming very angry when the experience doesn't work out, even though they're with the people they say they love and value. Or what about things? What if the person you love breaks the thing you have? You get angry at the person because you loved the thing more than the person. Right? You see this in children a lot. Children turn on their parents like that when they didn't get the thing because children, by nature, love things more than people. That's human nature. That's why if a parent takes the thing, the child gets angry at the parent because they don't love the parent only so far as the parent can provide them with the thing. And so this has to be taught. It has to be modeled. It has to be demonstrated. It has to be lived out. So quit. children have uh, a lot of these questions about identity, right? So beyond beliefs and values, they have questions about identity. What does it mean to have a mind, right? That's what they're learning uh, in the early years. What does it mean to have a mind? As they get older, what does it mean to be a mind among many minds? You know, your child will grow up in your community only to find what? That when they get older, that they will realize there's other people that don't see the world the way mom and dad said. I mean, I've got a friend, Billy Jack, and he says that, you know, all of this other stuff, mom and dad were always against that. But now I'm, now I'm what? Well, I'm entertaining alternate views. Because now I'm a mind among many minds. I'm not just in the home being taught how to use my mind. Now I'm being subjected. And your children will be. They will be subjected to other ways of thinking. Other ways of viewing life. Other ways of measuring truth. So the question is, as a parent, how are you preparing your child to deal with that onslaught? Because it's coming. It's coming. They will be inundated with worldviews that are completely upside down and contrary to everything you've always taught and stood for. So what will they do? Well, that's the big question. We don't know what they will do, right? But we labor as a parent to equip them for the battle because it's looming and there's a lot on the line. I mean, this is your, when you're the age of 16, 17, you are on the verge of something big because what used to be your parents' value system and way of thinking, now you kind of have that, but it's being challenged. Not everything that you're hearing in church, other people in other churches are hearing different things. Other people in other groups are being taught differently. Other people in other homes had different rules, had different expectations and experiences. So now your thoughts, as now I'm speaking to the children, now your ideas are being challenged. What will you fall back on? What will you do? Well, I think a lot of it falls onto the idea of, have they been instructed and do they realize and do they know that they are not the standard of truth, but there is one that they can go to and find, what do I need to know? And ultimately, like I said, the primary fundamental principle is the fear of the Lord. Children want to know, where did you get the information you have? Again, they don't come into the world with information. And our job is to give them a principled foundation. Where did you get what you have? And how can I know what you have is good? And that's why I say, when we become arbitrary in our exercise of our obedience to Christ it will harm us and our children. And that's why over and over again, the Lord tells them in this passage, do the things I've taught you and then teach them. Do them and then teach them, right? And it has to be so in our life uh, because it's, again, so much on the line. Where did you get your information? Is it something that you came up with? Because if you did, then I'll come up with my own. If, if you just get to decide what kind of a husband to be, if you just get to decide what kind of a father to be, if you just get to decide what kind of a mother to be, if you just get to decide whether or not uh, you want to 
to work and provide or whether or not you, you have to uh, be a keeper at home or whether or not you just get to decide how to do any of these things, if you, that's all self-derived, then good for me. I'll figure out my own path. I'll discover my own truth. I'll find my own way and live my own life. And there's a lot of that going on. The only thing is, nobody's finding their way. <laughs> they all think they're going to go out to find their way, but they're not finding it. They're lost. And they only get more and more lost in the Rubicon of finding my way. This is the way. Jesus Christ said, I am the way. You want to find the way, find Jesus Christ. He's the way. So children want to know about how to be a mind among other minds, how to deal with alternative worldviews that will challenge them. Not every family does things the way we do them. So why do we do them the way we do? What is the basis for all of these things? Can we model for our children a trust in the unchanging word of God? Do they see and know that the reason we do it this way is because the word of God instructs us to do it that way? And we believe and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ that as we follow his teaching, that that will be the most blessed and joyous path we can walk in life. Regardless of the allure of all these other views and opinions. Practical points. I'll finish with this. How do, what does a principled foundation look like as you progress through the parenting process? Well, I believe in the ages one to five, it looks like consistency. Consistency. I told you no, and no has value. No means no. Right? When I pick you up to hold you, that's my prerogative as a parent. Yeah. I will hold you, and you will be content. If you are not content to be held, I will continue to hold you until you learn that my will is over your will. I mean, children just have to know these things. The child, when they learn that their will dictates what will happen in the future, they have learned a bad lesson because that's not the way the world actually works. And, and you're setting them up for not only failure in this life, but certainly as it relates to their relationship with God, they can't have one. You can't even understand the concept of God when you think your will prevails. To be God means your will wins. I mean, it's, it's implied with the very word God. <laughs> it's not about our will winning the day. He's God. And your child has to learn that from a young age. Otherwise, you're setting them up. So this has to do with one-on-one -on -one application. One-on-one -on -one interaction with the child. Being consistent. I told you no, it's no, you get a swat, go on your way. Right? I mean, I'm not sitting you down for an hour and a half and lecturing you. You're three. You get a little swat on the behind, send them on their way. But they've learned something that the word has value and it's consistently applied. And I'm the authority and you need to listen to what I have to say, right? I mean, there's a lot of principles at work that relate to an individual and God that ought to relate to a parent and a child. After all, we call him father and he calls us what? Children. I mean, so it's, it's clear that there's intended to be uh, some, some learning and some application there. This idea of consistency ought to focus on behavior. In the ages of one to five, what are you focusing on? Behavior. You are not developing their ability to reason. You are not developing their ability to think. You are developing their ability to do what they're told. If your child cannot, by the age of three or four or five, do what they're told, you've missed it. You've missed it. You're going to have a hard, hard time parenting successfully past the age of five if you cannot have a child by the earliest years know how to do what they're told. So the, the ages of one to five, what you're looking for is being consistent as a parent, teaching them that word has value. Your focus is on behavior. Ages six to 10, 
What is the child beginning to look for? Uniformity. Now, uniformity is different than consistency. And again, this is just kind of my own ideas. It's not like this is the book on parenting. This is just your pastor's advice, uh, pastoral counsel on parenting. The child is beginning to examine, okay, I understand consistency and behavior. Now I'm looking for uniformity. Are these things evenly applied to everyone else like they are to me? Now this may not apply if you have an only child, uh, but in a home with multiple children, your child is beginning to examine is this equitable? Are mom and dad consistent, not just with me, but are they consistent with the whole family? I mean, is this, is this, are they just picking on me? <laughs> I mean, are they just picking on me because, uh, you know, I broke mom's uh, vintage vase and now she's angry. Uh, so what are the, the child is still kind of poking and prodding to examine, is this principled or is this arbitrary? That's what they want to know. And when they see that it's uniform across the entire family unit, they realize this is principle. It's the same for me as it is for my siblings. And guess what? Mom and dad even apply the same rules to themselves that they apply to us. When they mess up, they ask for forgiveness. I mean, it's the same. They, they see uniformity. And child between the ages of 6 to 10, I think they're looking for that to examine uniformity. And what does this have to do with? Or is there a respecter of persons aspect to this community or not? And ultimately what you're focusing on is less about just behavior, but you're beginning to develop the idea of choices. Okay, by the time a child is 6, 7, 8, it's not just behavior and I said don't do this, whatever. But you're beginning to develop the concept in their mind of a choice that I made and the resulting ramifications, right? It's a similar concept to behavior, but you're, you're expanding their thinking now to think about how did I get here in a more deliberate way, right? So I think focusing on a child's ability to think about choices and how different choices lead me down a different path. By the time a child's 10 years old, they should have a pretty good grasp on that, which sets you up for 11 to 15. What I think children need in ages 11 through 15 is authenticity. Your child is beginning to become more analytical. They're, they're beginning to understand more of the complexities of relationship. They're developing more emotional depth uh, in their own character and in their own nature. They're beginning to think about things more deeply than just accepting and receiving things at face value like they probably did in their earlier years. So in these years, the child is uh, going through a lot of these things. And I think in parenting, they're looking for authenticity. Is this for real? Is this for real? Right, because they're, they're ultimately going into a season of life where they're going to really firm up their own convictions and beliefs. And they're looking at mom and dad saying, is this for real? I want to know if this is the real deal. What are we doing here? Is it really about the people? Are we really doing the things that we've said my whole life that we're doing? Or is this some kind of a shell game mom and dad play to get me to go along? Because that happens all the time. And when a child begins to realize that values and morals are leverage for mom and dad, that's a problem. Because they figure that out. They figure it out. And they say, mom and dad are just using this stuff against me. But it's not real. There's too much hypocrisy. There's not enough conviction. I don't even know if they believe it. So when they begin to feel like that all of this stuff is just leverage that mom and dad use to get the family going the way they want or to keep, uh, you know, some parents, mom and dad, it's all, about the, it's all about the show, right? Don't you dare embarrass the family. You embarrass the family, you're going down. I mean, faster than Charlie Brown, right? I mean, it's just, I don't even think that's a saying, but it rhymed, right? It's just, 
<laughs> you don't embarrass the family. You're gonna you're gonna walk. You're gonna toe the line. You're gonna do it because we said so, and that's the way. Right. So when they begin to feel like this is just leverage for mom and dad, things will come apart real fast. So I think from the ages of 11 to 15, authenticity. What are you trying to develop in the child? It's behavior from one to five. Choices from uh, six to ten. From 11 to 15, you're developing their reasoning. How are they thinking through things? And there's a reason for that. Right? They've got to learn how to reason through because what they come up against at 16 to 20, when they're on the verge of really big stuff because they're about to leave the nest, as it were, and go out into life and figure this thing out. Um, you know what the children, I think, are looking for at 16 to 20? We've just kind of broke into this season of life, uh, so I'm maybe speaking a little prematurely here. But they're looking for usefulness, I believe. Are the things you've taught me useful? Can I, can I use them? Are they, are they helpful to me in my life to help me navigate, to help me discover, to help me uh, avoid pain and, and unnecessary difficulty and hardship and heartache? Uh, and I think, and I hope that our children who've been taught in the way of the Lord can see that when you follow Christ, boy, it sure is helpful. Because you can see other people who've chosen not to follow Christ. And you see how badly things go off the rails real fast. And it can get real ugly. And people go through a lot of pain and a lot of heartache and a lot of hardship when you don't follow the word of the Lord, when you don't listen to the Lord Jesus Christ, when you're not listening to the one who made you and said, you ought to do it this way. I mean, it's so when your kids can begin to see that, then they're looking for usefulness. And what they're ultimately focusing on in this season of life is their own beliefs and convictions. Between the ages of 16 and 20, your child, for the most part, will firm up what they believe to be true and what their convictions are about things. It's not that those things can't change past the age of 20. Obviously, the power of God is present to do anything. But I've seen continually in Christian homes. Okay, I'm not talking about the power of God to show up in a big way in homes where he was not known, where his name wasn't named, where the word of God wasn't preached. I'm talking about in homes where these things are common knowledge. That by the time a kid's 20 and they firm up their direction, uh, I've not seen a lot to give me... Um, reason to believe that once a child has turned their back on the faith for for whatever reasons that were that were happening in their own heart and in their own mind many of which do stem from the home it's it's not fun to admit that people it's just not fun to admit that but we have got to get real it is not good enough to pretend that we did everything just right We've got to humble ourselves before God and say, we made big mistakes. We did, we did things wrong. We really missed it on some things. Our children saw things in our lives that weren't right, that they shouldn't have seen and witnessed. Right? I mean, there's just, we've got to get real. And, and you see some parents... Uh, who, who child after child just turns out a train wreck uh, and you talk to them and, and it's like, I don't know what I could have done differently. It's like, you don't know? How do you not know? I mean, we're, we're still going through it and we already have a long list of things we wish we had done differently. You can't possibly raise a family and just say, I can't, I, we did everything just right. I can't think of anything uh, that, that I could have done different to help them Help them out along the way. No, that's not, that's not good enough, and it's, not, it's disingenuous. It's disingenuous of us as parents to excuse ourselves and to shift all of that squarely on the child. Because the truth is, that child grew up in a home, and that means something. Now, they will make their own choices. They will choose their own direction. They will have to ultimately, as an individual, choose where to put their trust in their faith, but they don't do it in a vacuum. They don't do it in a vacuum. And so there is some responsibility. Clearly, God puts that responsibility squarely on the shoulders of the parents. 
okay, squarely. As uncomfortable as it may be, <laughs> um, but it's squarely there. So this is, I think, the breakdown. And um, so I'll finish with this, Luke 6.48. And um, apparently these lessons may be a little bit longer than, than some others. Uh, we're about an hour right now, so hopefully that's okay with everybody. Um, Luke 6.48. You know, this, we were talking earlier uh, in, our, in our discipleship course in the back about how the Lord works in his word. And it's, it's interesting how this came up, and I'm going to use it here tonight. Luke 6.48. The Lord Jesus Christ says, um, he that hears his words and do them is what he's talking about. He says, he's like a man which built a house. What are you doing? What is a home? It's a house. I mean, you are building a house. Now, all through the word of God, that's abundantly clear. That the little community you're building, you're building a house. Right? So what are you going to do? Now, here, I believe the Lord Jesus Christ is speaking individually. Right, so I don't, I don't want to confuse the fact that I don't understand the context. The context is clearly about a man and his house. Uh, and so I'm not saying uh, that the Lord is speaking about the family, but I will say the principle applies perfectly to the family. It's a perfect application, even though the meaning, uh, the meaning itself is to the individual. The application certainly fits for the family. He says he's like a man which built a house and digged deep. That sounds like a lot of work, right? Well, raising kids is work, right? Time to show up for work. He dig deep and laid the foundation where? On a rock. Now, the way scripture interprets itself is helpful because what does the rock signify? Well, if you go back to Deuteronomy 32, verses 3 and 4, the song of Moses, he says, because I will publish the name of the Lord. Ascribe ye greatness unto our God. He is the rock. He is the rock. You want to build a house that will stand. You want to give a principled foundation so that your child knows where to plant his feet. There's not any other foundation there's not another only on the Lord Jesus Christ Apostle Paul says that's the only foundation available to us so it's absolutely essential in our homes that our children see that our authority is given it's not self derived how are your children going to know that your authority is given and not self-derived? Because they need to see you submitting yourself. Submitting yourself to the person under whose authority you are. And when they see that, with consistency, they will know. Mom and dad are operating on someone else's behalf. They're not just whimsically and arbitrarily inventing things along the way that are convenient for mom and dad. But it's rooted and grounded on the rock. It's built on something substantial, something eternal, something meaningful, something bigger. When you start thinking about how is our family going to dress what, how are we going to clothe our bodies? What does it mean to be a Farnsworth? And why do we dress so weird? Why, do the, why, do the, why does the husband, I don't see him out in his yard mowing in shorts. Uh, why do the girls always have dresses on? What does it mean to be a Farnsworth and why? Because there's some things in God's word that have been rooted and grounded on the rock that testify to me that I am under the authority of Christ who's commanded these things. And so why do we assemble ourselves together when we're not all down with COVID, right? Why do our children see us bringing them to church every time the doors are open? Why do they, why do they see us bringing them here when the doors aren't open so they can work and do things and help and assist in the work of the church, right? Why do they see that? It's not just because it was our idea. But I can take them to the book of Hebrews and I can show them the words of our Lord and say, because we've been taught by our maker 
that this is how it ought to be done so that it might please him and bring him glory. Right? And everything, the more you can direct your little community to this foundation and say, this is what it means to be in this family. This is what it means to be a member of this community. This is why we do it this way. But far too often what you hear is, I dress this way because it's hot. I dress this way because it's comfortable. I listen to this music because I like it. I do uh, uh, all the things that are what self-derived, and the child figures it out. Okay, I'm the I'm the author of truth. I get to decide. I'm the arbitrator of what is right and what is good and what is necessary. I'll decide, and they do, and they do. But if they're going to choose that path. I would hope that it could at least be said it's not because that we taught them that they could. At least let it be said that we showed them the good and the right way. They may choose a different path, but let it not be said of God's saints that we showed them that path and said, feel free, I've walked it too. And it's working out fine for me. Far be it from God's people to have such an attitude. So, P. <laughs> there it is. Principled foundation. Your children deserve it. God expects you to provide it for them. This is among the list of services that parents are called to provide. Amen. Hope that's a help to you. Brother Adam, if you come, maybe we'll sing Jesus Loves the Little Children or something. I don't know.